How's it going, everybody? Looks like I have A&P by John Updike. I've never heard of this guy before. Um, never heard of this story before. And this one looks, doesn't look like it's going to be very long, um, thankfully. I got three shorter short stories, I guess, if I would call them that, to read and get done. I think I can get them all out today. We'll see what happens. Which would be good, because then I'll have the rest of the week to listen to them and then write about them a little bit later on in the week. I think this one's supposed to be a little bit more upbeat. Thank goodness, because uh, listening to all these other longer short stories is pretty depressing. I mean, I could only imagine, like, when the younger generation, the high school kids get into these, like, short stories that are depressing. I could I can imagine how their temperament would change. It kind of explains some of the high school behavior that I used to see when I was in high school. But anyway, this is A&P by John Updike. In walks these three girls in nothing but bathing suits. I'm in third checkout slot with my back to the door, so I don't see them until they're over by the bread. The one that caught my eye first was the one in the plaid green two-piece. She was a chunky kid, with a good tan and a sweet, broad, soft-looking can with those two crescents of white just under it, where the sun never seems to hit, at the top of the back of her legs. I stood there with my hand on a box of hi-ho crackers, trying to remember if I rang it up or not. I ring it up again, and the customer starts giving me hell. She's one of these crash register watchers at which about 50 with rogue on her cheekbones and no eyebrows. And I know it made her day to trip me up. She'd been watching cash registers for 50 years and probably never seen a mistake before. By the time I got her feathers smooth and her goodies into a bag, she gives me a little snort in passing. If she'd been born at the right time, they would have burned her over in Salem. By the time I got her on her way, the girls had circled around the bread and were coming back without a push cart, back my way along the counters in the aisle between the checkouts and the special bins. They didn't have shoes on. There was this chunky one with a two-piece. It was bright green and seams on the bra were still sharp and her belly was still pretty pale, so I guess she just got it, the suit. There was this one with one of those chubby berry faces, the lips all bunched together under her nose, this one and a tall one with black hair that hadn't quite frizzled right, and one of these sunburns right across under the eyes, and a chin that was too long. You know, the kind of girl other girls think is very striking and attractive, but never quite makes it, as they were well known, which is why they like her so much. And then the third one, that wasn't quite so tall. She was the queen. She kind of led them. The other two peeking around and making their shoulders round. She didn't look around. Not this queen. She just walked straight on. Slowly. On these long, white, prima donna legs, she came down a little hard on her heels, as if she didn't walk in her bare feet that much, putting down her heels and then letting the weight move along to her toes, as if she was testing the floor with every step. Putting a little deliberate extra action into it. You never know for sure how girls' minds work. Do you really think it's a mind in there or just a little buzz like a bee in a glass jar? But you got the idea she had talked the other two into coming in here with her. And now she was showing them how to do it. Walk slow and hold yourself straight. She had one of a kind, dirty pink, beige maybe. Bathing suit with a little nubble all over it. And what got me, the straps were down. They were off of her shoulders, looped loose around the cool tops of her arms. And I guess as a result, the suit had slipped a little on her. So all around the top of the cloth, there was this shining rim. If it hadn't been there, you wouldn't have known there could have been anything with her than those shoulders. With the straps pushed off, there was nothing between the top of the suit and the top of her head except just her. This clean, bare plane of the top of her chest down from the shoulder bones like a dented sheet of metal tilted in the light. I mean, it was more than pretty. She had a sort of a oaky hair that the sun and salt had bleached, done up in a bun that was unraveling. 
and a kind of prim face. Walking into the A&P with your straps down, I suppose it's the only kind of face you have. She held her head so high her neck, coming up out of those white shoulders, looked kind of stretched, but I didn't mind. The longer her neck was, the more of her there was. She must have felt in the corner of her eye, me and over my shoulder, still Kessie in the second slot watching. But she didn't tip, not this queen. She kept her eyes moving across the racks and stopped and turned so slow it made my stomach rub the inside of my apron and buzz to the other two who kind of huddled against her for relief. And then they all, and then they all three of them went up the cat and dog food, breakfast cereal, macaroni, rice, raisin seasoning, spread spaghetti, soft drinks, crackers, and cookies aisle. From the third slot, I looked straight up this aisle to the meat counter. And I watched them all the way. The fat one with the tan sort of fumbled with the cookies. But on the second thought, she put the package back. The sheep pushing their carts down the aisle. The girls were walking against the usual traffic. Not that we have one-way signs or anything. We're pretty hilarious. You could see them. When Queenie's white shoulders dawned on them, kind of a jerk or hop or hiccup, but their eyes snapped back to their own baskets and on they pushed. I bet you could set off dynamite in an AMP and that people would buy the large keep reaching and checking oatmeal off their list and muttering, let me see. There was a third thing. Begin with A, asparagus, no, ah, yes, applesauce. Or whatever it is they do, mutter. But there was no doubt. This jiggled them. A few house slaves in pin curls even looked around after pushing their cards past to make sure what they had seen was correct. You know, it's one thing to have a girl in a bathing suit down on the beach, where what with the glare, nobody can look at each other much anyway. And another thing is the cool of the AMP under the fluorescent lights against all of those stacked packages with her feet padding along naked over our checkerboard green and cream rubber towel floor. Oh, daddy, stroke easy said besides me. I feel so faint. Darling, I said, hold me tight. So guess he's married with two babies chalked up on his fuselage already. But as far as I can tell, that's the only difference. He's 22. And I was 19 this April. Is it done? He asked, the responsible married man finding his voice. I forgot to say he thinks he's going to be manager some sunny day. Maybe in 1990 when it's called the Great Alexandrov and Petroshki Tea Company or something. What he meant was, our town is five miles from a beach with a big summer colony out on point. But we're right in the middle of town. And the women generally put on a shirt or shorts or something before they go out in the car and into the street. And anyway, there are usually women with six children and varicose veins mapping their legs and nobody, including them, could care less. As I say, we're right in the middle of town. And if you stand at our front doors, you can see two banks and the congressional church and the newspaper store and three real estate offices and about 27 old freeloaders tearing up Central Street because the sewer broke again. It's not as if we're on the Cape. We're north of Boston, and there's people in this town haven't seen the ocean for 20 years. The girls had to reach the meat counter and were asking McMahon something. He pointed, they pointed, and they shuffled out of sight behind a pyramid of Diet Delight peaches. All that was left for us to see was old McMahon patting his mouth and looking after them, sizing up their joints. Poor kids. I began to feel sorry for them. They couldn't help it. Now here comes the sad part of the story. At least, my family says it's sad. But I don't think it's so sad myself. The store pretty empty. It's being Thursday afternoon. So there was nothing much to do except lean on the register and wait for the girls to show up again. The whole store was like a pinball machine and I didn't know which tunnel they'd come out of. After a while, they came around out of the far aisle, around the light bulbs, records at discount of the Caribbean 6 or Tony Martin Sings or some such gunk you wonder they waste the wax on, six packs of candy bars, and plastic toys done up in a cell phone that fall apart when a kid looks at them anyway. Around they came, 
Queenie is still leading the way and holding a little gray jar in her hand. Slots three through seven are unmanned, and I could see her wandering between Stokes and me. But Stokesy, with his usual luck, draws an old party in baggy gray pants who stumbles up with four giant cans of pineapple juice. What do these bums do with all that pineapple juice? I often ask myself. So the girls come to me. Queenie puts down the jar and I take it into my fingers, icy cold. Kingfish fancy herring snacks and pure sour cream, 49 cents. Now her hands are empty, not a ring or a bracelet, bare as God made them. And I wonder where the money is coming from. Still with that prim look, she lifts a folded dollar bill out of the hollow at the center of her nubbed pink top. The jar went heavy in my hand. Really? I thought that was so cute. Then everybody's luck begins to run out. Lingle comes in from haggling with a trunk full of cabbages on the lot and is about to scuttle into that door, marked manager, behind which he hides all day when the girls touch his eye. Lingle's pretty dreary teaches Sunday school and the rest, but he doesn't miss that much. He comes over and says, girls, this isn't the beach. Queenie blushes, though maybe it's just a brush of sunburn I was noticing for the first time, now that she was so close. My mother asked me to pick up a jar of herring snacks. Her voice kind of startled me. The way voices do when you see the people first, coming out so flat and dumb, yet kind of tony too. The way it tickled over, pick up, and snacks, all of a sudden, I slid right down her voice into her living room. Her father and the other men were standing around in ice cream coats and bow ties, and the women were in sandals, picking up herring snacks on toothpicks off a big glass plate, and they were all holding drinks the color of water with olives and sprigs of mint in them. When my parents have somebody over, they get lemonade, and if it's a real racy affair, Schlitz in a tall glass with, they'll do it every time, cartoon stencil on it. That's right, Lingle said, but this isn't the beach. His repeating this struck me as funny, as if it had just occurred to him, and he had been thinking all these years the a and was great big sand dune and he was the head lifeguard. He didn't like my smiling. As I say, he doesn't miss much, but he concentrates on giving the girls that sad Sunday school superintendent stare. Queenie's blush is no sunburn now, and the plump one in plaid that I liked better from the back, a really sweet can, pipes up. We weren't doing any shopping, we just came in for the one thing. That makes no difference, Lingle tells her, and I could see from the way his eyes went that he hadn't noticed she was wearing a two-piece before. We want you decently dressed when you come in here. We are decent, Queenie says suddenly, her lower lip pushing getting sore now that she remembers her place, a place from which the crowd that runs the AMP must look pretty crummy. Fancy herring snacks flash in her very blue eyes. Girls, I don't want to argue with you. After this, come in here with your shoulders covered. It's our policy. He turns his back. That policy's for you. The policy is what the kingpins want. What the others want is juvenile delinquency. All this while, the customers had been showing up with their carts, but, you know, sheep, seeing a scene. They had all bunched up on Stokeski, who shook up a paper bag as gently as peeling a peach, not wanting to miss a word. I could feel in the silence everybody getting nervous, most of all Lingle, who asked me, Sammy, have you rung up their purchase? I thought and said, no, but it wasn't about that I was thinking I go through the punches, four, nine, grok, tot. It's more complicated than you think. And after you do it often enough, it begins to make a little song that you hear words to. In my case, hello, bing, there you go, happy pull, splat, the splat being the drawer flying out. I increase the bill, tenderly as you may imagine. It just having come from between the two smoothest scoops of vanilla I had ever known were there and pass a half a penny into her narrow pink palm and nestle the herrings in a bag and twist its neck and hand it over, all the time thinking. The girls, and who'd blame them, are in a hurry to get out. So I say, I quit, to lingle. Enough for them to hear. 
hoping they'll stop and watch me. Their unsuspected hero. They keep right on going into the electric eye. The door flies open and they flicker across the lot to their car. Queenie and Plaid and big tall Goonie Goonie. Not that as raw materials she was so bad. Leaving me with Lingle and a kink in his eyebrow. Did you say something, Sammy? I said I quit. I thought you did. You didn't have to embarrass them. It was they who were embarrassing us. I started to say something that came out fiddle dee doo It's a saying of my grandmother's. I know she would have been pleased. I don't think you know what you're saying, Lingle said. I know you don't, I said. But I do. I pulled the bow at the back of my apron and started shrugging it off my shoulders. A couple of customers that had been heading for my slot began to knock against each other, like scared pigs in a chute. Lingle sighs and begins to look very patient and old and gray. He's been a friend of my parents for years. Sammy, you don't want to do this to your mom and dad, he tells me. It's true, I don't. But it seems to me that once you begin a gesture, it's fatal not to go through with it. I fold the apron, Sammy, stitched in the red of the pocket, and I put it on the counter. I drop the bow tie on top of it. The bow tie is theirs, if you ever wondered. You'll feel this for the rest of your life, Lingle says, and I know that's true, too. But remembering how he made that pretty girl blush makes me so scrunchy inside I punch the no cell tab and the machine whirs. People, and the draw splats out. One advantage to this scene taking place in summer, I can follow this up with a clean exit. There's no fumbling around, getting your coat and galooshes. I just saunter into their electric guy in my white shirt that my mother ironed the night before and the door heaves itself open. Outside, the sunshine is skating around on the asphalt. I look around for my girls, but they're gone, of course. There wasn't anybody but some young married screaming with her children about some candy they didn't get by the door of a powder blue Falcon station wagon. Looking back in the big windows over the bags of peat moss and aluminum lawn furniture stacked on the pavement, I could see Lingle and my place in the slot, checking the sheep through. His face was dark gray and his back stiff, as if he'd just had an ejection of iron, and my stomach kind of fell as I felt how hard the world was going to be to me hereafter. All right, so that was it. That was A&P by John Updike. A&P, I'm guessing is, uh, from what I can tell from the story, the uh, name of the store that the kid worked at. I didn't like this story and uh, the way it flowed, okay? I'll give you an example. There was a line in there that said, um, he didn't like my smiling. And I originally read it as, he didn't like me smiling. So the natural flow that I had a tendency to read it was, he didn't like me smiling. And the line was actually, he didn't like my smiling. So there was these little like change up of words like that was from me to my, I naturally read it as me when it was actually my that changed the writing style enough to just trip me up that this entire read took me longer than I should. It should have took me because it just, I kept getting tongue twisted on these little things. It just, but if you mean, if you like the story, the story was all right. I just, me reading it out loud, it really fucked with my flow. So that's it. I will do one more or two more reads tonight. We'll see what happens. I'll see you guys on the next one. Oh, yeah. As always, use your leave your comments on YouTube. Um, if you're listening to the podcast version of this, leave your comments on YouTube. You can DM me on Twitter and Instagram, all those other things. All right, guys. See ya.